there, Internet. I'm Funky Monkey. And I've skipped a few steps on the road to the end game, mostly out of time pressures and focusing on the main thread. But anyway, let's return to these untold marvellous legends. And we begin by discovering how a gem of infinity ended up on the forehead of a genuine, artificial person. And of course, how such a machine came about in the first place. All of these magnificent marvels and more await in the Age of Ultron. Released in 2015, Avengers Age of Ultron is, as the title suggests, another adventure for the titular super team. Tony Stark has this crazy idea to put his shield around the world, but an unfriendly AI has its own schemes for Stark's creations. Also, Thor is given a mission by Divine Influence and the Hulk. Well, we'll get to that. So join me, my friends, for an untold marvellous legend. But beware, for the Avengers are about to enter the Age of Ultron. The Avengers are clearing up another Hydra outpost in the nation of Sokovia. But Hydra has a new trick up their sleeve. Presenting Pietro and Wanda Maximoff, volunteer twins for parahuman enhancement. Their powers? Pietro is super quick, Wanda has mind powers and other magics. Stark reaches the Hydra computers before Wanda Maximoff reaches him. Stark's waking nightmare doesn't stop him from recovering Loki's scepter. All of Stark's overzealous drive to defend and protect, it all begins here. And honestly, if I'd seen a vision of my friends being horribly mutilated and unalived in front of me, I'd do everything that I could to stop it too. Back in New York, the science bros investigate an alien AI and contemplate a new creation of their own. But this creation doesn't run entirely to plan. That evening, Thor offers his hammer. But our unworthy Avengers are unprepared for Ultron. But we know a couple of Sokovians who might be more accommodating. So why would a couple of ordinary Sokovians offer themselves to pain and possible death? As you might imagine, revenge is writ large in this tragic tale. Years ago, when Sokovia was at war for the umpteenth time, the family Maximoff were bombed out of house and home. And whose name should be written on the casing? You guessed it, Stark Industries. And so, our twins survive where their parents didn't, and look to avenge themselves on the Golden Avenger. The Avengers have a lot of catching up to do, and they start by catching up on Ulysses Claw, a black market weapons dealer who just happens to be in possession of a rather large amount of vibranium. And why? Fellow Monkey explains it better in the Black Panther review, but to translate, he nicked it with inside help. But for the full story, check out the Black Panther review, linked in the description. But oh dear, Ultron got there first. But our heroes are only seconds behind, and battle ensues. Enter Wanda Maximoff, to play upon the fears of our very human heroes. And even a thunder god has nightmares, but this nightmare will spark a vision that plays into the greater story. And Dr. Banner's nightmare is a big green problem, which even Hulkbuster armor can only contain. No, there's only one way to solve a problem like a Hulk. What it doesn't solve is the PR disaster that is an out-of-control Hulk loose in a major city. So now our heroes need a place to lie low. All of which leads our heroes to the unlikeliest of places. And up until now, you never would have thought that Clint Barton was a family man. But hey. While Ultron turns to Dr. Helen Cho. Now, why would Ultron need a biotechnician like Helen Cho? Or for that matter, all of the vibranium that he just bought from Claw? Well, Ultron wants to be a real boy. To stretch the Pinocchio metaphor. And to do that... He uses Cho's prototype regeneration cradle, and Thor contacts Dr. Selvig in an effort to understand his own nightmare. But oh dear, 
Ultron has a terrible secret. Ultron's true plan is to cause an extinction level event, in the form of a meteor. But since meteors don't just come along every day, he'll have to find a substitute. And that substitute? Well, you'll find that out soon enough. Enter our heroes to capture the regen cradle. One thrilling chase across Seoul, and a face turned by the twins later, the regen cradle is delivered to Avengers Tower. But is it truly second time lucky for Tony? Just ask Thor, because it's the God of Thunder that's delivering the juice to create something entirely new. Behold the vision! All of which leads our heroes back to Sokovia to set the stage for our finale. Remember that meteor plan? Well, Ultron plans to use the entire nation of Sokovia for it. Just wrench it out of the ground, thrust it skyward until dropping it would kill the world, then, well, drop it and kill the world. And that's with the civilians still on it. So of course, the Avengers move in to evacuate, with a little help from an old friend. And so, Sokovia is evacuated, and Iron Man looks to save the planet by blowing up a country. Sadly, Pietro is shot up later in the fight and drops dead and the Hulk ends up on a stealthed jet to who knows where. The Vision finishes the job, and destroys the final straggler. And so our movie ends at the new Avengers complex, as Thor sets off to find out about the remaining Infinity Stones, and we meet the new team. But you already know how they got on. Anyway, that was Avengers Age of Ultron. And I reckon that this one's a tale worth telling. Watching this movie again, it's surprising how much of it stands on its own. All of the characters and events you need to know are right here, and the story flows from start to finish without referencing a ton of outside events. It's streamlined in terms of the greater continuity. Well, excepting the Infinity Stones, of course. And while we could spend an age saying again that the main cast perform their roles expertly, by this point there's little more to say. Which leaves James Spader's Ultron, a gravelly voiced and charismatic villain, at points both witty and menacing. And of course, this is where Paul Bettany bodily debuts as the Vision, and he doesn't disappoint. Which brings us to the effects, which are suitably outrageous, especially the hectic action pan in the early minutes of the film, and I may be imagining this, but the Hulk looks the best he's ever looked in this movie. Which is a good thing, because he gets plenty of moments of his own in this one, such as the devastating Hulkbuster fight. But no film is perfect from start to finish, and the testosterone moment of comparing Pepper and Jane Foster is heavily cringy in my opinion. And while I can applaud the romance between Banner and Romanoff as an out of the box idea, the fact that it was destined to go nowhere is more than a little deflating. Still, this is another rip roaring roller coaster ride with all of the thrills, spills, and chills that we've come to expect from the Mighty Marvel Cinematic Universe. And there's plenty more where that came from. Join me next time as we dive into an eventful semester, I still prefer term, for Peter Parker, the Sensational Spider-Man. See you there!